This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. My guest today, consulting guru, incredibly handsome, incredibly smart, man (laughs) with the middle initial, David A. Fields. How are you, my friend? I'm doing outstanding with that kind of introduction. How can I do anything other than uh, be outstanding? It's only uphill from here. So (laughs) I want to start the way that that famous football coach came into the locker room every season in the NFL and said, gentlemen, this is a football. And in your case, it's not football, it's consulting. Because you are a true guru in the consulting world. And I'm going to tee you up the way that I like to be teed up, which is you have been the consultant. You have hired hundreds of consultants and you have helped other probably thousands of consultants raise their game when it comes to marketing, sales, and business development. And sitting on all three sides of the table, you've probably learned a couple of things. Yeah, true on all counts. Spent a lot of time hiring consultants, spent a lot of time helping consultants and being a consultant. And being a consultant, exactly. And so I say the exact same thing that I've been the speaker, I've coached the speakers, and I've helped, you know, hundreds of speakers raise their game when it comes to marketing and delivering their best value. So when speakers say, you know, I'm great at speaking, great in the classroom, great on the stage, speaking, training, all of that, they go, you know, people have said to me, I should get into consulting. Let's stop the tape right there. When you say, gentlemen, this is consulting, what does it take for a subject matter expert, someone who does maybe a lot of speaking and some training, to shift into consulting mode? Is there a consulting skill set? Does it come naturally to some people? How would you recommend people start to explore this if they have not been consulting before? Well, look, I I think there's actually really good news in in what you just suggested, which is if somebody's already speaking, if someone has figured that out, has figured out how to to win speaking gigs and is comfortable being up in front of people, they're actually way ahead of the game in terms of creating an independent consulting practice. The challenge is actually folks who come out of, of industry, for instance, or folks who have been working on their own and think they're very bright and want to solve a problem and go out in the world hoping that people have the problem that they want to solve and will somehow magically hire them. So, you know, in fact, I mean, really, there's two pieces of consulting. Consulting is very, very simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. There's only two pieces that are at the core of consulting. You win engagements, and then you create value for your clients. That's it. When engagements create value and you just keep that cycle spinning. Now underneath you have some infrastructure and maybe you've got some strategy around it, but that's it. Very simple. And so folks who are very good at creating value sometimes struggle to win engagements. And then they're not winning that, you know, creating value for very long because they don't have any clients. Folks who can speak have a huge advantage. Speaking is one of what I call the five marketing musts. And uh, speaking is by far the most powerful, fastest path to winning clients once you have the speaking gig, which is why the work you do, David, is so amazing and so helpful for folks. Thank you, thank you. I think I've heard you talk about this, about the different delivery modes that we sometimes call consulting. Because some people, on the surface, you know, you'll have a couple of consulting gigs where it's just really a series of training workshops. But maybe the client calls it consulting or the client has asked you for consulting and you decide based on your diagnostic conversation that the best delivery mode for that is, well, let's do a series of six workshops. Do we call it consulting? Do we call it workshops? So there's consultant as trainer. There's consultant as advisor. There's consultant as mentor, meaning, hey, been there, done that thousands of times. Let me guide you. Let me show you the tips and traps and where to go right and where to go wrong. There's also the consultant as the pair of hands. That's my least favorite mode of consulting where it's like right. long-term slave labor at a high cost. What else is there in that consulting toolkit as people are starting to think, well, maybe I, I should get into consulting? Well, I think you described it very well. There's certainly a spectrum from really, again, I'll, I'll break things down fairly simply. There's only three things a consultant can do that create value. They can either help a client make a decision. So it's something that's called strategy. So if I'm at A, where's B? Is B over here, over here, over there, right? So that's just strategy. Or they can help the client create a plan 
or figure out how to get. So we decided here's A and here's B. Well, how do you get from A to B? I mean, do you have to go through David's camera and back in or, or what? And then the third part is implementation. I actually take the client from A to B. So that's it. Figure out where B is, figure out how to get to B, get them to B. So anything that you do that provides one of those three, you could consider consulting. Now, I'm where you are. Implementation consulting, to me, gets very close to staff augmentation. And staff aug isn't really consulting. I'd say I sort of draw the line a little bit there. Now, there's a little bit of strategy, a little bit of planning, a little bit of implementation in every project. But the way you deliver that, there are myriad ways. As you said, training, you could do an internal speech, you could spend some time just on the phone giving advice or responding or just being there in a time of need it can be consulting. So that's sort of a mentor relationship. I see it work all sorts of ways. As long as you're sharing your outside advice, which is what consulting is, it's an advisory service, and you're helping folks figure out where A is or B is or figure out how to get there or getting them there, you're playing in the game. Now, we always like to also do a little inside baseball and kind of talk to people about how you came to do what you're doing and business model innovation and where things were and then where things were in the middle and what went right, what went wrong, and then where things are today. So I'm guessing that before you had your empire of, you know, all of these hundreds of consultants on this big magic Rolodex, before you did all of your fabulous online courses and online mentoring programs for other consultants, it was just David A. Fields, solo consultant, doing something for someone in the way that you just described. So paint that professional journey a little bit. How did you start? And then how did you start to innovate your own business? Sure. Okay. I'll try to do the short version. I did nine years in corporate. So I've, I've been on the corporate side and I have that experience. Blue chip, consumer products company. I joined a boutique firm. So I learned literally at the feet of the master. I say literally at the feet because one of the owners of this firm in his office, he liked to work around this low coffee table and sometimes there weren't chairs. So you would literally have to be kneeling kind of on the floor. And he was brilliant, truly one of the most brilliant consultants, marketers I've ever met. I worked my way up to partner at that firm. And at the time there were six partners. And uh, again, long story short, two of us decided to spin off and form a company. So that's where I started kind of on my own as I co-founded Ascendant, which is my company. Dave, that worked incredibly well for four um, weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And my partner decided to go in a different direction. So here was the problem. The problem was my partner was the relationship guy. My partner was the sales guy. He was the rainmaker. Whereas I was supposed to be the backroom engine delivery guy because those were kind of the roles we had played at the boutique. I'm a model builder. I'm an engine room down in the weeds, not deal with people kind of person. And so I find myself in quite a lurch because now I'm on my own and I had no clients. And so my first year went, uh, it was pretty rocky. I learned some things. I got a coach. I've always had a business coach. Week before I was up in Toronto spending a full day because you need someone, no matter how good you are, to help you be even better. So I got a coach, I got some help, and things started to turn around. And I built my own consulting practice. Then, you know, a couple of funny twists happened. One was I decided to create this consortium. It's become much more common now. Aggregators like Cadlant have become common where a firm will go to them and say, hey, can you put together a team for me? When I was doing this, it wasn't so common. So the idea of playing the role of finding consultants and hiring consultants for a client was kind of new. But that gave me the idea, you know, the opportunity to see it from both sides, which was excellent. Fast forward a little more, some of those consultants start saying, how are you winning that business? How are you doing this? And I will tell you, in absolute honesty, I started working with consultants, coaching them purely as a lark. I mean, like, ah, yeah, I'll do this once or twice. It'll be kind of funny. You know, no big deal, right? And, and now it's 95% of my business. I do some corporate, but most of my work is working with solos and boutiques and helping them, you know, succeed, helping them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And it's a blast. I mean, I love it. And of course, business has exploded. <laughs> so that's fun too. Hey, good looking. Are you currently getting paid to speak? Would you like to ramp that up? We can help. Book a confidential speaker strategy call with our team at doitmarketing.com slash call, and let's see what we might do together. The call is free, but the results may be priceless. So this is so fascinating because 
you know, I want people to really listen. I want, I want you to rewind this podcast right now and listen to those evolutionary steps. And David, you went through those very smoothly and very elegantly, but each one of those was really a pivotal magnifier and amplifier in both your impact and your revenue, correct? Yes, absolutely. So when these consultants were saying, hey, David, how did you get these gigs? Were you winning the business and then you were staffing them with subcontractors or was yes. it also a matchmaking service or did that evolve or change? Well, I was never a broker. My model was always the general contractor model. So you hire me because my expertise is knowing how to put together a really high value consulting project and deliver that value. Um, remember, I'm a backroom model guy. So that part, you know, how do you create enormous value is where I was good and clients would trust me. So then I would staff it with subcontractors, always bring in subcontractors. And I'm not shy about my model. My model was always, I will happily do 20% of the work for 50% of the money. <laughs> and, you know, that's a pretty lucrative model. Right. But underneath all of it is this central idea of, I will follow the market. Rather than saying, well, I want to do what I want to do and, and let me find people who want to buy what I want to do. I'm all about, what do people want to buy? I'll do that. <laughs> as long as it's fun and interesting and I'm creating value. And so when the market told me, you know what, we really want some help learning how to win consulting projects, how to create value. How do you build a really lucrative practice? Okay. Well, since I happen to know how to do that and that would be fun, I followed it. So I didn't lead there. I followed there. So let's talk about this big debate. And I think we have it in our businesses and I know our clients come to us with this all the time. It's generalist versus specialist. And or do I niche? Do I focus on this kind of project or this kind of industry? Like when you said, yeah. hey, I was on the inside nine years. It was a consumer packaged goods consulting practice. That was the line of business that you were in. You know, you weren't asked to revamp a hospital because you were in consumer packaged goods. And right. I'm guessing that they didn't ask the hospital consultant to say, hey, what flavored Cheetos should we put out in the grocery stores next? I love what you're saying. And I tell this to my clients all the time. Stop focusing on what you want to sell. Start focusing on what they want to buy. Right. At the same time, I also tell them experts win on value, generalists die on price. So even me, David, I've got conflicting sound bites, dude. Help me oh, out no. here. What is it? <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. There's really, there's no debate. So I don't know why there's a debate. The fact is you must be narrow. Period. The research on this, because there's research on this. The research on this is unequivocal, David. The research says the number one thing buyers look for, and for consultants, when they're looking for a consultant, they want industry expertise, whether that's right or that's wrong. Doesn't matter. And I argued that my first book was written for the buyers of consulting. And I was saying, don't look for situation expertise. Your situation is your industry, your problem, all of that. Look for outcome expertise. I may as well have been just talking to a concrete wall, rebar reinforced, all of it, because it doesn't change. Number one thing they're looking for is industry expertise. Then they're looking for expertise with their specific problem. What they really want, what they really want is to know that you have solved their problem for them, maybe just slightly removed. So the more you look exactly like you specialize in them, whoever they are, the better you are. Now, that's in your marketing. Once you get in, then you can spread out. So what I call the toggle bolt approach, you go in, narrow point, pushes you through the wall, then you can spread out and you try and get as wide as you can so they can't pull you out without making a massive hole in the wall. And to me, there's no debate. Research is really clear. So this is a flavor of sell them what they want very specifically, very narrow. But once you get in there, you might uncover a whole bunch of needs, three quarters of which you can happily deliver. Absolutely. I think where the conflict comes in and where it's challenging is when you say, well, wait a second. On the one hand, you say to be narrow. On the other hand, you say, follow the market. So how do I do both? Because the market's telling me lots of different things. Or if I'm narrow, then there's not many people in the market. And that, I think, is a really fair question and why it's important to pick the right problem to solve. This is the heart of impact. It's using what's the right problem? What do I solve? I mean, should I be figuring out how to do lean operations or and should it be for this industry or that industry? That is actually at the core of what makes a firm successful or less successful is understanding 
who do you solve a problem for? What problem do you solve? And then what's a compelling solution? If you can get that, you're golden. You can't get that, you struggle. Really, that is at the absolute core. And I see this over and over and over again. This is what separates people who, who struggle from when I see boutiques building 15, 20, 50, $100 million. They figured that out. Wow. Yes. Let's you and me figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Let's you and me figure it out right now. So you have, and you've always had this variety of programs that you offer. Some of them are a little bit more, you know, it's kind of like small, medium, large, super size. Some are online, some are live. Is this, by the way, and we'll talk about this fabulous live event that you have coming up. Is this your first foray into a paid standalone live event or have you done these before? I have done on very rare occasions. Now, this particular event that we're going to talk about because I have coming up, I ran three times last year, but I ran it for a private group of consultants. So it was invitation only. And people got to come in, which was great for me because while I got paid, I also got paid to beta test and get this thing perfect. Absolutely perfect, right? Because by the time, you you know, the first time you're like, okay, this is good, let me tweak. Second time, I'm like, oh, those tweaks work well, let me tweak another time. Third time, you're like, smooth, perfect. So yeah, I run it, but I run events live very rarely. Yeah. Let's just lay the cards on the table because people are on the edge of their seat going, what's the event? How do I get into the event? How do I get invited to the event? (laughs) So we've made a special link and it's going to be in the show notes and we'll talk about this, but it is, uh, I made the special link, David's Cool Friends. So David's Cool Friends will take you right to the front door of uh, one of my cool friends, David A. Field's event called the Solo Practice Accelerator. But right. because I want every single human being listening to this podcast to not worry about stop, pull the car over, er, write down solo, blah, 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 blah. Just remember this, David's cool friends. David's cool friends. And of course, David A. Fields might have cool friends. I'm not sure if I'm one of those, but he's definitely one of mine. So when I endorse something or I get behind it, I want to drive you to it, whether you're driving your car right now or not, go to David's cool friends when you're in front of your phone or in front of your computer and you'll get right to the good stuff. So. Talk about the different offerings that you've always done, because I know you've done some, I mean, I know you have the proprietary names for these things, but basically it's marketing training for consultants, sales training for consultants, positioning, honing your offer. Tell us all about those things and then tell us about some of the goodies that you've packed and planned into these two days. Sure. So I typically do separate consultants into boutique firms and solos. And because they operate different, what they're trying to do is different. And in all honesty, the fee structures are pretty different, like by an order of magnitude. But for both, in both cases, remember, I said consulting is really easy. You need to be able to win engagements and then create value, profitably create value. And so what I do with consultants is just, I work on those two pieces, is if you need to win engagements, how do we get that part going? If you need to learn how to scale, how do we scale? And for solo consultants, there's only a couple of programs. There's just, you know, working with me. I will very occasionally work with a solo consultant, literally in person, one-on-one, someone who wants to invest in a serious way and create major momentum. Most solos, we are working primarily on the phone. I have diagnostics. I can get them in the right direction. I mean, I've done this a long time. So I, I know what to look for and how to steer them right. I think right now, David, as I looked over the weekend, just again, for my own numbers, I think the average tenure is like 3.2, 3.4 years, something like that. So when folks join me, they stay because we're building the business. And that's pretty fun. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. And then boutiques looks different. We're working on the same things. You add a couple of other challenges in for a boutique because now you need to scale. You've got people involved. And how do you manage the people? How do you build a structure? All of that kind of stuff. So all of that, I mean, anyone who's interested, obviously, they just reach out. And if it seems like a fit, I'm willing to talk and go forward. The two-day event that we're doing live is very different because I rarely get a chance to work live in person, especially with solo consultants. And so I wanted to create that opportunity to, look, I mean, we won't get into, into you know, detailed fees, but your typical solo is not going to be able to hire you on your own, David, to come in and sit in the living room with them, right? Your typical solo is not going to be able to hire me to come in and just sit in their office with them. It just is what it is, right? Right. But this way, right, we can actually work hands-on with people 
And I think to me, it's even better because you get a group of people together who have similar situation and can work with each other and give them the right exercises, the right direction. It's been pretty amazing. I will tell you, I I wouldn't repeat this program if I wasn't completely blown away by it. And, And I was pretty blown away by it. So let's talk about this. This is um, someone needs to be up and running or can they be fairly new to come to the accelerator? Really good question. I'll tell you the most common feedback I heard from folks who had been in business for a while. It was, I wish I had had this at the beginning. So I already know from you know, seeing attendance already, we have quite a few folks who are just beginning like right at the very early stages. I think at least one is maybe even just hasn't even launched yet. And then we have people who are over five or 600 grand a year, all solos. This is truly for solos. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty good range. And folks who have been in business for a while are going to get a different level out of it because they're ready to accept some of the things or maybe put some of the things in practice that other people have to make back burner. Folks who are brand new are going to get those critical pieces in place that allow them to ramp up more quickly. All those things that people say, oh man, I wish I'd known this from the beginning. You get to know it from the beginning or you get to know it now instead of two years from now. Right. So this is one of those events that's actually pretty good for the whole range. I have recently become fascinated with the corporate executive making a transition, whether it's a C-level person who's kind of semi-retiring from their main business or handing it over to a family member and wants to, you know, you know, people see you and they see me and they say, hey, you look like you're having fun. I want to write books. I want to speak. I want to consult. And they're, you know, C-level or senior executives, or they're looking for the next chapter in their professional adventure. Maybe they're a VP of marketing or a VP of sales. When I've worked with these people, and I'd love your take on this as well, Whatever it used to say on the business card, used to say IBM, General Motors, Walmart, whatever it said, as soon as that business card no longer has that other brand on it, these people are stunned. No one returns their calls. No one returns their email. I mean, they used to have hundreds of people at their beck and call, snap the finger, say, hey, can I get a copy of this? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Hey, can we have a meeting? Yes. No, we're getting the meetings already happening. You join us in conference room B. The second you said it, the meeting convened. Now it's like, hello, hello, Bueller. Anybody? Can I get some attention? Can I get some love? Can I get some lead? And they're stunned by this. Yeah. They shouldn't be. But how do you acclimate from being a corporate bigwig to being a solo and not letting that totally demoralize you and then get into some couple meaningful action steps to help them get out of that problem? I've got bad news. <laughs> it's not easy. I see this a lot. One of the things that I, I see a lot, and I counsel boutique firms who are hiring, I actually counsel them not to hire line folks out of industry, meaning it, uh, someone who was a, a VP of marketing or a, you know, a, a C anything tends to be terrible when they come into consulting, at least for a year. It's about a one-year transition. Now, on the other hand, if you happen to have been in corporate and you were in a staff role, let's say you were the director of competitive intelligence and you served other departments, you weren't in a line role, you didn't have P&L responsibility, you're more likely to succeed because you already have that customer service attitude that you're used to that but still going to struggle because you're not used to winning clients. You're used to having the brand name or whatever your company is, is stamped on your head. By the way, that's also true of folks who come out of big consulting firms. They struggle also. On the other hand, if someone comes out of staff, right, if they're a director of competitive intelligence or, you know, product support or something operations, they're more likely to succeed because they already have that customer mindset. They're already used to serving someone, even if it's an internal customer. Now, granted, they don't have that brand name of their firm, the company kind of stamped on their forehead, which makes things so much easier. And I don't think they realize how much support they have. I think most corporate people don't realize how easy it is to be in corporate because you've got all, as you mentioned, you've got all these people at your beck and call, all these people whose job it is to make you successful. Well, if you're when you're on your own, you got one person to make you successful. You, <laughs> you need to do it and you need to do everything. And so it's a hard transition. I will generally tell people you should have a full year of runway, minimum, a financial runway in order to succeed and not have that extra layer of stress 
which makes succeeding that much harder, right? So if you've got somehow by hook or by crook, give yourself that runway or get a, a different job until you can have that runway. So that's my bad news kind of advice is it's not easy. It really isn't. David, I was talking with the CTO of one of the nation's largest newspapers. This was a, a few weeks back. And he said, well, I should be able to just have a, a million dollar, $2 million practice because I mean, look, I'm the CTO of this, one of the largest papers in the world, one of the most recognized papers in the world. Everybody's going to want me. <laughs> like, well, uh, I would like to see it because you might be right. And my view is always, look, I, I could be wrong. So give it a try. And if it works, let me know because that will help educate me and I can help other folks. It's not going anywhere. So because I, I've seen this story before, it's hard, right? You, people need to learn the stuff that you teach. By the way, I don't know if you can see because my books are over there. You probably can't see, but your book's right on the shelf over there, The Do-It Marketing. It's, oh, it's, very nice. Always, yeah, things are a little bit blurry there in the background, but thank you. <laughs> it's a Bible. Anybody who hasn't read your book in the last month needs to take it off their shelf and read it again. And you know what? That probably includes me. Well, there you go. All of us. Have you noticed this? Like, you know, so you've written a couple of fantastic books. When you go back and you reread your work, you're like, man, I could use that little tidbit of advice right here, right now myself. And I wrote the darn book. <laughs> All the time. I've written something like, I don't know, 400 articles now, something like that on consulting. And I will go back now and I'll look and go, holy cow, that's actually smart. Who came up with that? <laughs> yeah. So, Who is uh, that guy? Who is that guy? It's funny. Yeah. Let's talk about another popular myth or okay. myth busting, which is, you know, consultants, new or old, cold calling. Cold mm. calling gets a terrible reputation. They either associate marketing with cold calling. So, you know, they'll come to me, they go, well, no, I don't want to do any marketing because I, I just hate cold calling. <laughs> I'm like, what? It's like, I don't eat bananas because I, I love steak. What? That doesn't, what? Anyway, or you say, well, let's talk about sales strategies. Oh, no, I don't like to sell because I hate cold calling. Yeah. So there's a difference between, I know that you teach this in part of your outreach, because outreach is different than cold calling. Yes. And being proactive is different than making a whole bunch of cold calls to strangers and sounding like an idiot. What do you teach people as far as some of the scripting or some of the strategies so they're not, you know, what a lot of consultants do is they do a ton of content marketing and they wait for the phone to ring. Yeah. And they've bought into the whole inbound marketing is going to save your bacon. And yeah, that's no. a great way to starve. So let's talk about inbound versus outbound and what do you recommend to do this proactively and smartly without cold calling? Yeah, well, I mean, you have to do outbound. You just have to. My business is, I think, probably what most people would want, you know, and all modesty aside, with my latest book, especially, I get calls... I get multiple inquiries every week and I'll get people calling and saying, look, I picked up your book in the Atlanta airport or something like that, right? I mean, it's living the dream and I am incredibly blessed by that. However, I still do outbound because you have to. Marketing, the inbound takes so long to build and it's also, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it's not. I mean, my book's doing great now, but who knows what's going to happen in two years or three years, you know, hopefully the next book and the book after that, but you don't know. So you have to be constantly building your own network. I mean, you are in charge of your own business and your network. Now, I don't believe in cold calling. I'll give you one exception to that, actually. But I don't believe in cold calling. I believe very heavily in warm calling, in just nurturing relationships and starting conversations and being in conversation and not selling. I don't think consultants sell. I don't think consulting can be sold. I think consulting is bought. And you can put yourself there so that, you know, when David and you say, hey, you know what? I need some help with this. I should call David, right? That's how it works. But you can't call someone and say, you know what? You really need to redo your operations line or whatever it is. You feel like, what the heck? I don't, right? Or, you know, you got to redo your marketing. No, I don't. It just doesn't work, right? So, but what you can do is show an expert at something. If that problem occurs, you could think of me. And where that problem occurs is in conversation. So you have to be in conversation. And that means picking up the phone on a regular basis. Yeah, all of that is outlined how to do that. I do believe in scripts. I think scripts are helpful, not just to follow them, just so you have confidence. You're not spending so much time before you pick up the phone rehearsing in your head. Oh, what should I say? Oh, what do I say? Should I say that? No, that just is so much energy that takes. So I have it written down. You know what you're going to say. I have a script. I know my script so well, I don't have to have it on my desk, but for years and years I did. And you just got to pick up the phone. 
I think there's some general rules of thumb for how much, but just pick up the phone to pick, call people you already know or and get introduced to people. I will ask pretty much anyone and, and just about any call that I've had, hey, who do you know that's really interesting? Not who do you know who would want my business? That's an impossible question to answer. It's a horrible question. It doesn't work. But who have you talked to recently that you thought was really interesting? Real mover and shaker. Somebody would be really cool to chat with. That's an easy question. Plus, it's a positive question, right? Wow, now I'm thinking about someone I like, okay? So that's the introductions question. And then call them. Yeah, David said you were really interesting. He was really impressed. I thought, God, I got to talk to you. Right now, you're starting in a good place. Okay, here, I'm going to give you the exception on cold outreach. Done well. Done well, which is not easy. I think that cold outreach on LinkedIn can actually start to create or at least the opportunity to create relationships. And I'm seeing that evolve over the past year or two to the point where it's now becoming effective. I think the window might be fairly limited. I could be wrong on this because I think once everybody jumps in, LinkedIn is just going to turn into complete spam and then nobody will pay any attention. But I think you can, if you do it well, reach out to people highly targeted in a way that's not pushy and create the relationship. And then some of those relationships will evolve over time into clients. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. I want to dig into all of what we just said in the past couple of minutes. The premise of the conversation, and I do this a couple of different ways. I do it, I mean, you and I have been friends for years, but I do it on the premise of a podcast. I would maybe do it under the premise of researching an article. Absolutely. When you say, David said you're a really cool person to talk to, I have to talk to you. Obviously, it's not the only thing you say. What's the premise or what, what are some of your favorite premises of this conversation? Is it to showcase them, learn from them, get tips, um, bring them yeah. to your audience? How do you do that? Yeah, you brought up some really good ideas, actually, also, which is true. I have seen the, I'd like to interview you for my weekly article or my weekly podcast be very, very successful. So that's another way at it that you can go. You just have to remember, you can't go from that to, and by the way, can I do business with you? That doesn't go over so well. That's a way to, to ruin your own reputation pretty quickly. Yeah. So now, David, I'm a little uh, perhaps strange on this one because of, of my definition of wealth. My definition of wealth is relationship strength. I believe the more vibrant, healthy, strong relationships you have, the wealthier you are. So I think anything you do to build a relationship makes you wealthier. And therefore, when I'm calling you, I don't need any pretext other than I'm actually interested in you. <laughs> I want to find out how things are going. I'm not trying to sell business because I'm honestly not. I know that if you need my help, you're going to ask for it. I don't need to push it. What I do need to be is in contact with you. I need to be in relationship with you. So I actually tend not to use any pretext. I simply say, I want to know what's going on. And I am genuinely interested in the other person, which, by the way, is not natural for me. That is a learned behavior. That's a learned skill. I am not naturally a people person. Remember, I'm a backroom engine person. I'm actually a quant geek. I, you know, I got degrees from Carnegie Mellon. So <laughs> I'm happy just on my own, hiding in a cave, you know, tapping at a you know, calculator with a green hat and all that. What I have learned is that people matter. And I have pushed myself for years and years and years to be interested in people. Now I genuinely am interested in people, right. but it's a learned behavior. I don't need any pretext other than I want to know you. And you know what? I have never met someone who's in their heart doesn't want someone to pay attention to them. That's all that's needed. No one says, oh, don't, you know, would you stop caring about me? <laughs> no one says that. It's true. That's really profound. Somebody, and I want to give attribution here, it might have been Jeffrey Gittimer, it might have been somebody else, but the soundbite is, don't worry about being a better salesperson, just be a better person. Yeah, that's nice. Be a better person and the sales will come. Yeah. That's what you're espousing and that's what you're embodying. Yeah, and just pay attention to them. The more you focus on them rather than you, the easier this business is. The more you focus on them, the more you can hear what do people want. When you focus on a lot of them, you start to say, oh, wait, a lot of people want something that I can provide. Then you find the right problem. 
because you're finding something that a lot of people want that's urgent, that does relate to you. And you focus on them and you hear when they say, oh man, I, I'm just dying for some help. And then you can say, hey, would you mind at some point if we discuss whether or not I can help you with that? Very soft, very invitation-based. I am. Now, that's my approach. I do know folks who are successful with a more aggressive approach. So I, I don't want to say that being aggressive is necessarily wrong. I think for a lot of consultants, it's very difficult. That's just anathema to them. I mean, it's not who they are. But there is a way to be focused on results and be that kind of person who doesn't want to be salesy and to still succeed. And that, I think, is really important to understand. Yeah. No, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, here's another sound bite. I'm, I'm just a collection of sound bites today. Uh, and I do know who said this because it stuck with me for many, many years. It was Seth Godin, probably 10 years ago. He said, the sooner in a relationship or even in a conversation, the sooner you ask for money, the less you will get. Yeah, that's probably right. Well, Unless they're know, coming to you saying, can I give you money? <laughs> right, right, Exactly. Well, I've got just a couple of final questions for you. The okay. final, final question is how Dude. can people get more David A. Fields and resources and blog and newsletter and all that kind of great stuff? But even before that, okay. second to last question is, if people were to take one key concept from our conversation today, what would you hope that concept would be? Oh, the fundamental underlying concept for, to make consulting successful. It's not about you. It's about them. And the consulting is not about you, it's about them, the client. That is so easy to say, and it's actually so hard to put into practice. I tell people, take a look at the first line of your email. Right after you say, you know, dear Bob, what's the first word of the first line? It's probably I, right? And what's that telling you? So with a lot of practice, you learn to start your emails with you. You were delightful to meet. You were great on that conversation. Something about them. Make it about them. So consulting is not about you. It's about them. The more you learn that, the easier this business is. Period. Mic drop. Absolutely right. So how can people learn about you, you, in, in this case, you, it's okay to talk about you. Yeah. To help them, they need to connect with you. We already talked about the event. Is it davidschoolfriends.com? Yep. But what else in the David A. Fields empire can we point people to? Well, I would just say come to the website. and It's pretty easy to navigate. So davidafields.com. And uh, just come there. Obviously, people can pick up the book. It's, if you were to Google Guide to Winning Clients or going to Amazon, uh, it's there. David, we are, I think, six reviews away from being the most reviewed, most high-starred book on consulting, building a consulting practice ever ever. We're still number two right now, but got to remember the number one book was released 40 years ago. <laughs> so you, you can pick that up. Just come to the, the site, davidafields.com. I'm actually very accessible. People reach out from the site on a daily basis. So that's the easy way to, to do it. If you're a solo practitioner, you should definitely come to the event that's coming up if you can. It is an awesome event. I love this event. I've had so much fun with it. New York City, end of February. We're going to yep. link it all up. We're going to post that so you guys have plenty of time to get in and make your travel plans and do all that good stuff. And then David A. Fields, we're going to have to have you back because this is just miles and oodles of additional conversation that we need to be having. <laughs> you and I always have fun because you do things so well and I appreciate what you do. And I think we're in sync. So we're having fun. Hopefully all of your folks who are watching are enjoying it also. Awesome. All right, my friend. Until next time. You the man. <laughs> you the man. Talk to you soon, David. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe. Tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 